Okay, you got the answer, so we're not going to have time to do all of them, so you got the answer to the ones we don't. Who else wants to play popcorn? And I got the Cheeto one too. Anybody else?
If it's not drawn for you, please draw it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's for you. It's scratch work for you. What's the perimeter? What is it on this problem? 160. And yes, how do you get it? Add up all the sides. We have a formula. We could say 2L plus 2W, or we could simply say L plus W plus L plus W. Perimeter simply means distance around. Add them all up. Okay, let's do the problem. See if y'all have written any of this down yet. A rectangle has a length that is 8 meters longer than double the width. And what's the simple one there? The length is 8 meters longer than double the width. What's the real easy one there? The width. The width. So I think Mr. Shari likes to use X. I usually go ahead and use W. So for the width, I'm going to say it is W. You can use X if you want. Does it make any difference? What did it say about the length? Longer than double the width. Eight longer than twice that. So I heard somebody say it. Eight plus two W. Okay. You can use the formula, or you can simply add up all the sides. What is the perimeter? We know the perimeter. Add up all the sides. If this one's W, what's this one? W. This is eight plus two W. What's this one? Let's add them all up. What do we have? W plus... You can do W plus W. I usually go around. W plus... 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 Okay. Did we go all the way around? W plus A plus 2W plus W plus A plus 2W. Make sense? So far? Yes? No? <laughs> Can't see it. Okay. Now what are we going to do? Combine your life terms. A W, a 2W, a W, a 2W. What do we have? W, 2W, W, 2W. 6W. And we have an 8 and an 8. Okay, so we've collected our like terms together. I'm trying to find the width, so what is my next step? Isolate. Isolate the W by subtracting the 16 first. So 6W would equal 160 minus 16. 144. Okay, last step. Divide both sides by 6, okay? And what do you get when you divide 144 by 6? 24. Am I finished with the problem? No. No. What have I found? The width. How am I going to find that length? Add 8 to twice that. Twice that, so twice the 24. What's twice 24? Plus 8? 56. What is it? 56. All right, so these were meters. So we're looking for a width of 24 and a length of 56 meters. Do we have that on here? 8. 8? Okay. Questions on that one? All right. Okay, we're going to skip over to number five. Yes, we're going to go down to problem number five. Mrs. Morosky, Mrs. Shower, and Mrs. Glover. Okay, so number four is uh, kind of similar to five. Uh, both of these problems have to do with the laws of exponents. And problem number five, we have a fraction that's raised to a power. Okay, 
with this fraction inside the parentheses and a minus 2 on the outside, what does that tell me to do with this negative 2? Every one of these factors is going to have the minus 2 implied, right? So we're going to say x, and this is a 1, and I multiply these. So x to the minus 2, y to what power? Negative 6. And then in the denominator, x to the negative 8, and y to what power? Negative 2. Okay, now am I done with this problem? No. No. I have a couple of things I need to do. I want to make sure that I have only positive exponents, so I'm going to do that. And also when I finish, I want to make sure that I only have the x written once and the y written once. So the first thing I'm going to do is get positive powers. To get a positive power, I'm going to move that quantity across the fraction bar. Now, it's not swapping, okay? Some people get the impression that it's just swapping, but it's not. I'm going to take this x to the minus 2 and bring it across the fraction bar, and it becomes x squared, okay? Still in the numerator, the y to the minus 6, what will I do with that? y to the 6 in the denominator, and then x to the minus 8 becomes x to the 8 in the numerator, y squared in the numerator. Okay, now I'm not quite through because, see, I have x to the 8th over x squared. What do I do with those exponents? Subtract them, and where does my answer go? On top, because that's where my biggest exponent was. Okay, and then what about the y? On the bottom, and it will be to what power? Okay, let's see, do we have that in our choices? Choice B. Alright, anybody have a question? Let's do a couple of scientific notation then. We'll do both 6 and 7. The first problem we have written in our standard or decimal notation, and we want to convert it to scientific notation. Let me count these zeros. Yes. You have a question over here. I have a question. Um, wouldn't the 2 come down minus 6 and become a negative and then you have to bring it back up? What? I'm sorry, say again? On the y, when, when they're both positive, when they come over to the positive over here, right there, when uh -huh. you subtract 2 minus 6, wouldn't that become a negative? Well, no, I'm going to the place where the biggest exponent is, which is in the denominator, and I'm subtracting the small one from it and leaving it where the big exponent was to begin with. Okay. All right. So here's our next problem, write it in scientific notation. Now you need to think about scientific notation. It's made up of two parts. It has a number part and then a power of 10. And this number part, how many digits are going to be in front of the decimal? One. One. So what I'm doing is I'm coming to this place right here, right? So I'm going to have 3.312 times 10 to a power. And the way that you determine that is to count off from here to this position. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then you have to determine, is it negative 5 or is it positive 5? Okay, I'm hearing both answers. It's negative. Now what I tell my class, because I have trouble myself remembering if you move it this way, it's positive. If you move it that way, it's negative. The way I remember is 
small number, small exponent. Okay. So this was a very small number to begin with. See all those zeros? So that means my exponent is going to be small or negative. All right, question on that one? Okay, then we have in number seven, we have the opposite process. We have our number written in scientific notation and we want to write it in standard or decimal notation. Okay, now I'm going to move my decimal and I'm going to move it, this allows me to move it this number of places, four, and again, that's a positive four. So I'm going to make my number big. So I'm going from here, four units to the right, in order to make this a larger number. One, two, three, four. So four, five, three, two, two. Oh, I forgot to look at the answer was there on the last one. I'm sorry, y'all. Okay, this one was there. What was this answer? Let's see, times 10 to the minus five. That was B. And then seven is, did I count that right? One, two, three, four. Yeah, that's right. So it's D. Anybody have a question? All right. I'm going to throw one in real quick, because you might see this on the final. Uh, th these are written in scientific notation, correct? Is it correct scientific notation? And what does this say to do to it? Multiply. Okay, when we multiply that, y'all can check me, but if I did my multiplication correctly, we get 10.35 times 10 to the, and what do we do when our power bases are the same? What do we do to the exponents? Add them, so this would be times 10 to the 7th. All right, all I did was multiply the uh, digit parts together, the 2.3 times the 4.5, and then the powers together. Now, is my answer a proper scientific notation? No. No, why not? Because you, you only have to put that one point of decimal. You need to move that over. So it would be 1.035 times 10 to the, did I make this a bigger or a smaller number? Yeah, smaller number. Smaller, so to compensate, I need to make this part Eight. bigger. So it would be 10 to the 8. Eight. Okay, so just in case you see one like that on the test, you might write that one down multiplication. Don't always leave your answer what you get, you might need to change it. Okay. Next. Number 12. <laughs> it says. Find the x and the y intercepts and then graph. <clears throat> when you hit the x axis, what is the y coordinate when you're on the x axis? Anything on this line right here, what is the y coordinate? Zero. When you're on the y axis, what is the x coordinate? Zero. So the intercept method, all you have to do is let x be zero and solve for y, let y be zero and solve for x. Easy peasy. So all you have to do up here is let x be zero. So you've got negative 2y is negative 6. So what does y have to be? 3. And if y is zero, then x is? And what do we have right here? We have two points. Where is zero, three? Negative six, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six. And draw your line. And that's it.
Uh, 14 says substitution and 15 says addition. Uh, both of those we have two equations. What do we call this? When we have two equations? A system. Good. And what does it mean to solve a system? What does that mean? What are you looking for when you say solve a system? Solve for your variable. You're looking for not a variable, but a what? A point. You're looking for that one point that they both have in common. If you were to do it on the graph, which sometimes we do solve by graphing, what are you looking for? That one point where they intersect. Exactly. All right. But we're not using the graphing method. We're using substitution and then addition. But we're still going to get an ordered pair. On the test, they may just ask you what's the x value. They may just ask you what's the y value. But I would go ahead and get the whole ordered pair so you can do what with it? You've got the ordered pair. What can you do with your answer? Plug it in and check it. Where? On both equations. All right, substitution method. What does substitution mean? Substitute it, plug it in. What we want to do on substitution method is either get an x or a y by itself. I like to do things the easy way. What's the easiest variable up there to get by itself? X. Which x? It's on this one right here. We're going to try to get that x by itself. Once we know what that x is, we're going to plug it in in place of the other x. Alright, so I'm working with the first one. It's the only thing I have to do to get the x by itself. So x would equal, it doesn't matter about the form, but we can go ahead and say 3y minus 15 or negative 15 plus 3y. Doesn't make any difference. Okay, what does x equal? 3y minus 15. What am I going to do with that 3y minus 15? Plug it into this x right here. Okay. So I have what property since I've got that 4? Distributed. Distributed. Because I've got to put all this, so I need the parentheses. 4 times all of this minus 4y equals 4. Y'all said distributed property? I draw my arc so I don't forget. What do we get here? 12y minus 60. 60 good. Minus 4. equals 4. 4. Back to what we were doing a while ago. I need to collect my like terms. Do y'all see any? Okay, 12y negative 4y. Minus 60 equals 4. How am I going to get that y by itself? I'm trying to solve for y. So 8y equals 64, correct? Okay, a little sloppy here. What's my last step for this part? And what do I now know? Y is 8. Am I finished? Because I need the whole ordered pair. So what am I going to do now with that y equals 8? <laughs> Which is the easiest to plug into? Good. And we like to do things the easy way if we yeah. can. Okay. X equals 3 times 8 minus 15. 3 times 8? Minus 15. And the answer would be? Teachers, individual test. Do that ordered pair, parentheses, comma, but again on the test, it might have the whole ordered pair, or it might just say the y value is, and if it had y value is 9, would that be correct? No. <laughs> might trick you that way, so look for that, okay? All right, is that one soaked in? Mm -hmm. Okay, the second one, number 15, actually, we're going to do the addition method. We're still doing a system of equations, so we are looking for an what? ordered pair. All right, let's see if we can do this one with addition. What does that mean, addition? It means to add them. Okay, we add like terms with like terms. Am 
I going to go ahead and add right now? No. You, Why not? Because you got to get one of the bells to cap each other out. When we add, there's something special we want to happen. Can I erase all this? Sure. What do we want to happen when we add? We want one, one of the variables to, to add up to zero. zero to cancel out. Right now, nothing would add up to zero. I see this one's a negative 7y, this one's a positive 4y, so I would probably decide to get rid of my y's. doesn't matter, you can get rid of your x's or your y's. I want to be able to add these, so this adds up to 0y. This is a little bit harder one, because 7 is not a multiple of 4. So I'm going to have to change both of these. What am I talking about changing? Multiply. Multiply. Oh. What's the least common multiple of 7 and 4? 28. So I want one of them to be a negative 28 and the other one a positive. You may show it a little bit differently or your teacher might, but I usually just put parentheses around the whole thing. What am I going to have to multiply by to make that a negative 28? 4. But the 4 has to be multiplied by everything, even the thing on the other side of the equals. So what do I get here? 28x minus 21 equals 168. Okay. I'm still trying to make this a negative 28y and this one a positive 28y, so what am I going to multiply this one by? And the whole thing has to be multiplied by the 7. 7 times 4y, I mean x, 7 times 4y. Ooh. And 7 times negative 16. Is that right? Check my arithmetic. I'm going fast up here. <laughs> Y'all got calculators. Check me real quick. Are we ready to add? Why am I ready to add? Because I've got something here that will add up to zero. Either my x's or my y's. Which one's going to add up to zero? Y's. Okay. And what's 28x plus 28x? And again, what happened to the y's? Okay, so they're gone. And I've got to add, these are all positives, right? No, negative. Okay, so I've got a 6, a 5, is that right? Positive? Okay, so that was just subtraction. Okay. Last step on this part. And what's x? One. Well, I expect it to be a little number with those big numbers for both. Am I finished? <coughs> what do I do now? I have to plug it in. I don't, I don't have an easy one like on the other one because we didn't do the substitute method, substitution method, but I can take that one and plug it into either one of these. Which one do you want me to pick? The second one. Good. <laughs> I like it best too. I look for the smaller numbers. <coughs> what is four times one? Four. Already next. Four y equals divide by four. And y is so my answer is the ordered pair. Is that fast enough? <laughs> we apologize for having to go fast, but we only have an hour. And as you see, we're not going to be able to cover the whole thing. All right, on this same vein right here, what would happen if your variables disappeared on you? What would happen if your variables disappeared and you ended up at the bottom with 0 equals 5? What does that mean? No solution. It is a false statement. The answer is no solution. If you were to graph those two lines, what does that mean? Those two lines would have been? Parallel. Okay, one person remembers. All right, the parallel. Parallel means Remember, he was talking about we're looking for what? Where the lines intersect. intersect. So if they never intersect, they are there you go. So what would happen if we got down to the bottom and it was a true statement? 
infinite. So this would be infinite solutions. And if you were to graph it, we would be what? Perpendicular. It would be on top of each other. It would be the same line. Every point on one line is also on the other one. All right, so that's 31 and 32. You can make a note of that. All right, let's jump to number 19. Ms. <laughs> Morowski picked some excellent word problems on here, but most importantly, is this the problem on your final exam? Okay. No. <laughs> So whenever there is a word problem on the review, it means it is representative of those word problem sections that you did this year. So make yourself a note. I'm going to go back and I'm going to look at each one of those word problem sections. All right, we're going to look at number 19. I like to organize this type of problem in a box. Your teacher may not do it that way. There's nothing magic about the box. It's just organizing your information. All right, so it says, we're going to fly on an airplane with the wind and against the wind. And it's talking about how fast it goes, and it's talking about how far we're traveling. So what formula do we use here? D equals RT. D equals RT. So up here I'm going to put rate times time equals distance. And once again, I'm just using the box to organize the information. It says a twin engine air aircraft can fly 1,400 miles from city A to city B in how long? Five hours. Five hours with the wind. So where does that go? Oh. On the top. With the wind, five hours, and how far? Uh, 14 hours. All right, then we're going to turn around and we're going to go home. How far is it here? 14 hours. The same distance. How long does it take this time? Seven, Seven hours. All right, so we have the speed of the plane. And we have the speed of the wind. <clears throat> I'm very original, and I call one of them X and the other one Y. If you want to be really original and do P plus R, you go for it. Okay? So the speed of the plane, the plane can do what the plane can do. So we're going to start here with the rate that we have to play. But then, what happens when the wind is helping you along? When you're with the wind, what's happening? Plus. So that would be x plus, plus, plus y against the wind. What happens now? Minus. So now you're against the wind and you have x minus y. All right, what does the formula say? Distance equals? Rate times. times. So we have on the top 5 times? x plus y is 1400 and on the bottom we have and that is your system now we're not i'm not going to take the time to solve the whole thing but let's just talk about what we're going to do here in order to solve this we're going to do what <coughs> distribute And then you're going to solve it by what? Which method? Addition. The addition method. All right. We're going to do problem 20, and then we're going to go back to problem 10. Okay, both of these are radicals. So this is something that we've done just recently. Okay. 
and the instructions say simplify. Okay, what that means is if I have any perfect squares under that radical, I want to bring them out. Okay, so when I look at this, I've got a lot of stuff being multiplied together under the radical. Now what this really means is, and you can think of it like this, is that each one of those factors we're looking for the square root of. Okay, so you may have worked your problem like this. Um, some students work it like this. Some instructors start by working like this, and then I'm going to show you a shortcut method as well. Okay? So the square root of 64, what is that? 8. Okay? And then we have the square root of x to the 10th. Now, what is the number right up here? Two. Two is the index here. You can think of this as what is being squared, or the shortcut that I referred to is this. I'm going to say two goes into ten five times. So that's x to the fifth when I simplify that. Okay. This one that the two into, and what's my exponent here? One. One. So that doesn't really go into that. So I have to leave that y under the radical. There's no perfect square with this y. z to the fifth, again, you can think of what's being squared there and then what's left over. Or the shortcut method is to say 2 goes into this 5, 2 times with 1 left, you may say over, I like to tell my students 1 left under the radical, okay? So the square root of 64, x to the 10th, y, z to the 5th, you'll get this, like I said, you may get there in a different way, but this is your, your answer here. Any questions? Maybe you've seen it a little differently and need a little more explanation, or is everybody good? Everybody's good? Okay, let's go back to another radical problem, number 10. Like radical. 
So if you're having trouble factoring these things, that's something to keep in mind. All right, so let's go ahead with our simplification here on this middle term. I'm going to take the square root of 25, which is what? 5. And when I bring it out, am I going to add it to this 3? Multiply. Multiply. Okay. And then the 5a stays underneath. And then in my last term, square root of 9 is 3. three. That's going to be multiplied by that minus 7 that I already have as a coefficient there. Okay, so again, continuing to work, I need to do these calculations. 3 times 5, this is 15, square root of 5a. What do I get as my coefficient here? Negative 21, square root of 5a. So look at all the radicals. They're all the same, aren't they? So I can, how do I combine these then? The what am I adding? The outside. The outside. And what's in front of this one? One. one. So I have 1 plus 15, 16 minus 21. Negative 5 square root 5a. And that is answer choice B. Any questions? Is that okay? We're looking at number 22. We're still working with radicals. And all we're doing is simplifying. <laughs> Okay, it's said to simplify. First of all, if we had a perfect square under the radical, under the square root, we would, yeah, number 22, we would want to take that square root and put it on the outside. Is 48 a perfect square? No. And I always think it's a good idea to have on your paper when you're doing the test on your scratch paper, have all your perfect squares. One times one, two times two, three times three, write down as many of them. So you have them right in front of you. It's a good idea to do that. Okay, 48 is not a perfect square, but what Mrs. Glover was showing you a second ago, is there a perfect square that's inside of here? So we break 16. 48 up into 16 times three. And we do that because 16 has a perfect square root, which is 4. It goes on the outside. Am I done? No. No. Can I cross out these threes? No. <laughs> Why not? This one's not inside the radical. This one is. This is 3. That's not really 3. It's something between 1 and 2, but it's not 3. All right. Why is it not simplified? Because there's a radical in the denominator. We have a rule that says oh. you cannot leave a radical in the denominator. So how do we get it out of the denominator? It's called oh, it's it's rationalizing the denominator. If I'm going to multiply the bottom by itself, I'm going to have to multiply the top also. What am I multiplying top and bottom by? Square root of 3. Square root of 3. Square root of 3. I want to get this radical in the denominator out of there. What is square root of 3 times square root of 3? Yeah. Square root of 9, which is actually three. 3. So the radical goes away in the bottom. But if I multiply the bottom by the square root of 3, I must also multiply the top. Because really, what is square root of 3 over square root of 3? Yeah. I'm just multiplying by 1. I'm not changing the value. I'm changing the way it looks. Now let's see if y'all remember how to multiply. They don't have to be like radicals to multiply. They do to add. This is just a plain old 3. This is the square root of 3. I've got 3 times the square root of 3. It's like having 3 times x. What do you have? 3 the square root of 3. That, and that's all I can do. On the bottom, I'll go through all the steps. Four. What's, what number's out here? 1. one. 4 times 1? 4. But the square root of 3 times the square root of 3? 
square root of 9. It's not distributive. We're just multiplying how many of them? Uh, 4 times 1 is 4, and the square root of 3 is square root of 3 is square root of 9. I'm still not finished. What else do I need to do? What is the square root of 9? So I have 3 square roots of 3 over 4 times 3, which is actually 12. Am I finished? No. Because what can I do now? Reduce, simplify, divide top and bottom by 3. You get a 1 here and a... So what's my final answer? 3. Radical 3 over 4. Three over four. Oh, no. And that one is A. Question on it? No? <laughs> yeah. All right, we're going to jump to number 26. All right, on number 26, what they're trying to tempt you to do is say x equals 10 and 3x plus 13 is 10. Can we do that? If a times b is 0, then a is 0 or b is 0. It's called the 0 factor property. Is it called the 10 factor property? No. So what do we have to do before we can set this up? It has to be in standard form. So how do we get this to look like this? Eventually, what do we need to do first? Oh, and Sally says so. X times 3X is? 3X squared. X times 13. Move the 10 over. Now it is in standard form. <clears throat> what do we do next? We're going to solve by factoring. So we're going to do any way that you want to factor, you can. So your teachers may have taught you various and sundry ways to factor. 3x squared is 3x and x. The last term is negative. What does that mean about my signs? One positive and negative. One positive, one negative, opposite signs. When you think of 10, what factors do you think of? All right, so we're looking for, since they're opposite signs, we're looking for an outer and an inner that subtracts to the middle term. So if I have a positive 5 and a negative 2, then I have a positive 15 and a negative 2. Does that give me this? Yes. Yeah. What? No? What? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm doing it by trial and error once again. Your teacher may have taught you various other ways to factor, and that's fine. So you set each piece equal to zero. Alright, so we have two solutions. We have negative 5 and positive 2 thirds. Now I want to warn you about how they're going to ask you this question. They may say one of the solutions is between. They're going to give you an interval. For instance, if I said between negative 9 and negative 6, is one of these in between here? No. No. If I said between 0 and 2, is one of these between there? Yes. Yes. Two thirds is between zero and two. So it's really important to read the question. All right, that's all we have the time for today. If you'll fill out the green sheets and hand it to Ms. Glover. Does anyone need one? Uh,